My discovery really was that the family courts uh, contain some of the most extraordinary dramas. Uh, fiction and uh, TV and film rush to the criminal courts, of course. But in the, in the family division, we find, for example, the end of love, which is what else is divorce, but the end of love. Matters relating to children, all kinds of issues relating to life, death, and, and everything in between. And it seems to me a neglected and wonderful treasury. I mean, I read a lot of judgments when I was researching the novel. Not only that, judges' judgments are, uh, and they're very proud of their prose. And their prose is generally very good, and some of them get quite good reputations as, as, as master and stylists. You, you've got to respect their judgments, forget the prose, the actual judgments. Do you think they do a good job? On the whole, I think the family courts do an amazing job. Behind all that sort of arcana and tradition and gowns, not that gowns are worn in, uh, and wigs are worn in the family courts, but behind all that uh, are a lot of very hard-working, reasonable people trying to inject some degree of reason into often chaotic and really painful situations. And they're doing it six times in a morning. I mean, it, it really is extraordinary, the turnover of cases that a judge has to confront and then all afternoon and then preparing for the next day. So Emma Thompson is the judge in the movie. What would you do in that case? Would you override the young, the religious, the religious young man's wishes? Well, I, w I mean, one of the most civilised pieces of legislation in this country, and actually occurred under Mrs Thatcher, not that she cared a great deal about social workers, is the, the thing called the Children's Act piece of legislation. And in its very first sentence, it says, the welfare of the child is the court's paramount consideration. So the child then doesn't become simply the thing of the parents or the uh, possession of a god. Uh, and this is what interests me about all this, a conflict or a collision between the secular court or the secular state and the courts of the kind of arm of that state and deeply held sincere, profound religious belief. So uh, in this particular case, because it's Jehovah's Witness, because it's a child, but almost an adult, in need of uh, a blood transfusion to save his life, the courts actually have a fantastic guideline. What is the welfare of the child? Well, on the whole, we don't think children are, are better dead than alive. So, so you know, it, if you were the it, judge, at least, you would, I would, you would, have, find, I would abide give by him the Children blood, Act, yes. Give him the blood yes. transfusion. Now, you're treading in this area on a, what is a very resonant and important set of you know, issues that are very current, aren't, mm -hmm. aren't you? Sort of the relationship between religion, religious tolerance, freedom, and I suppose in more recent terms, free speech. And I wonder, do we, do we respect religion too much? Are we scared of religion? Does it get too much licence in a country? How, how do you feel about it? Well, I, I feel we're all over the place at the moment. I mean, we really are in, in great confusion. But I would like to see the core of this as being that the best guarantee of religious freedom and religious tolerance should be a well-organised secular state. Um, we haven't banned the burqa, and I'm very glad about that. There are mosques up and down the land. Uh, the courts and the state should take no view as to the, on the existence of God. No view at all. Right. Let everyone... So the flourish. atheists are nice and neutral, so they're sort well, of better at respecting... A, well, they can be thrown in with a, lot, uh, with a lot of them. But on the whole, I think that taking no view on the existence of God in matters of moral issues like this and doing the best by what you should do for, for a child... Uh, then you have to actually challenge the authority of any particular god. You have to say there is a higher authority. It's called the law. Yeah. Obviously, we have had discussions about the burqa very recently and free speech. Where are you on, on that spectrum? I'm almost all burqaed out, I have to say. <laughs> but if, if this was a simple matter of free speech, like, let's say, it was a mini version of the Rushdie affair, then it would be simple. We'd say, well, some mockery, some criticism... We've got to take all that. Uh, but this has gone beyond this because there's political motivation, there's political contest, a uh, high office. I'm f very faintly depressed when I pass uh, someone dressed head to foot in burqa. But on the other hand, I think they represent such a tiny fraction of the right. adult population that I don't think we should be going to war about it. Right. Bigger I mean, problems. If, if challenged, I would say, well, since the early 19th century, since Mary Wollstonecraft, women have had a long, slow struggle to get themselves 
into the public space and the burqa would seem to be a denial of it. But this denial is coming from so few people that I just don't quite grasp what the heat and light of this is about unless we're talking about rabble-rousing and uh, some versions of populism. Right. And that's why it can't just simply be a matter of free speech. Right. We're in and, great confusion. Well, well, tell us what you think of where the country is, because, of course, you're burkered out. A lot of people feel they are, and a lot of people feel... What the heck is going on? We're talking about anti-Semitism in Labour, Islamophobic behaviour in the mm. Conservative Party, and we've barely, you know, we're heading towards Brexit, which no one quite seems to know where it's going to end or how it's going to go. What do you make of where we are? Well, you could take a benign view that um, public issues, uh, people are not asleep about it. I mean, when there's a, yeah, there's you know, a the voices engagement. are loud, we're not, yeah. we are not asleep. Uh, I, I try and tell myself that, that it's ferocious. Uh, sometimes the public debate, partly driven by the Twitter sphere and the social media world, is far angrier than one remembers it back in the 70s and 80s. Um, I think we're in great confusion. I think that um, the populist right, it certainly gives me a great deal of anxiety. I think... I'm not Brexited out, by the way. Burke it out, maybe, but Brexit, I still think uh, that um, we could well be heading into a kind of a disaster. I think we really need to change course. Um, I'm very disappointed at the way it's going. I think a soft Brexit will illuminate the absurdity of it all. It's almost as daft as a hard Brexit, because then people are going to say, well, we, work, we can't make the laws, but we'll still be paying the cash, uh, so let's go back to square one. You're, you're a a slightly older person than I am. Is Britain a stable country? Is, is what we're going through now an aberration? I, I do think we've got the jitters. Uh, but it, it is incredible. We are living in interesting times. I mean, I think there's a worrying trend across Europe, um, and your programme has covered this at various points very well, um, in which the old democratic, liberal world order is being severely challenged, but not in a rather very benign way. Uh, and I think our own politics is now... Maybe it's no longer possible for the Conservative and Labour parties to even survive in their present forms, and that they're just going to break up into lots of smaller, uh, more individualistic uh, voices, and the confusion will be even greater, and the interests will be even greater too. Well, the film is great. Children Act, Ian McEwan. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Ian.